my name is Jack Sushi. I'm a visual artist and a researcher into art practice. Um, my paper is entitled Multiple Viewpoints, a Deleuzean Approach to Artistic Appropriation. Transfiguration, in the literal sense of the word, means not just the transformation of the appearance of something, but the revelation of beauty, spirituality or magnificence. This paper is contextualised within a theoretical framework that draws heavily on Deleuze and most particularly on his book The Logic of Sensation in which he engages profoundly with the work of British artist Francis Bacon. As I myself am a visual artist, I have a vested interest in the nature of practice and here I'm taking a Deleuzean approach to explore the way that artistic appropriation of photographs, primarily of the human form, can transfigure the original documents through the creative process. The paper is in two parts. In the first part, I'll demonstrate how the work of photographer Edward Mybridge has influenced many artists, including Bacon himself and Scottish painter Ken Curry. In the second part, I'll discuss a particular project of my own in which I used a multiple focus portrait photograph as the basis for a large scale figure drawing. The aim of the project was to transfigure the photograph through the subjective art process, and this discussion is intended to build a bridge between theory and practice by demonstrating the essential visual character of artistic appropriation and also highlight the extent of the Deleuzean rhizome, upon which the drawing is only a plateau, a pause in the endless connectivity of substance and form, ideas and function. And so we begin. In the late 19th century, Edward Mybridge achieved well-deserved recognition as the first photographer to comprehensively document animal and human movement in an overtly objective and systematic way. His photographs have been widely appropriated by artists, most specifically here by the acclaimed Anglo-Irish painter Francis Bacon, the famous contemporary Scottish painter Ken Curry, and by a less well-known English artist, it was truly. Mybridge's work was based primarily on scientific experiment. Although some of the resulting photographs are aesthetically beautiful in their own right, it's doubtful that Mybridge himself intended or saw them as fulfilling any other role or purpose than for that which they were intended. That is, documentary evidence of the finest detail of physical movement. Artworks based on the photographs, however, can be testimony to far more than is understood by simply regarding them as copies or adaptations of the original. The paintings and drawings stand in complex relation to their source, and artistic appropriation of Mybridge's photographs is far more than simply copying, even in terms of simple motivation. If only as products of an extended process, rather than the instantaneous results of varying shutter speeds, these works already address the disparity between photography and art in terms of the temporal flux. But more importantly, they conflate basic ideas of function and purpose with an abstract conception of the human figure as an intangible essence, the spirit, divergent from its tangible form. It's this difference, that between figuration and the figure, that provides a conceptual framework for the rest of the discussion. The spirit, ah, the spirit, isn't that what art's all about? In basing a work on the photograph, the artist must affect more than simply the transformation of photographic documentation into its artistic nemesis. What would be the point of that? As Deleuze insists, the artist must push his practice beyond the source of his labour and transfigure the subject by rejecting transformation and embracing deformation. Only in this way can he move towards an expression of the true humanity, the spirit of the human form. Even Plato, notwithstanding his ambivalent relation with artists and the polis, tells us that practice is the vehicle by which form becomes idea, the fair absolute beauty. The terrible paradox, however, lies in the fact that this beauty, the spirit desired, the true resemblance of the humanity of a human being, is only ever fleetingly found in the spirit of the chase. Because transfiguration is only brought about through the creative process, and such a process is by nature never-ending. The artist, therefore, is a slave to action, and must face the Sisyphean challenge of forever searching for the spirit, but forever failing to capture it. As an artist with a bent towards philosophy, 
I live a paradoxical existence. So you'll forgive me if having acknowledged the futility of trying to capture humanity with the creative act, I now describe my attempt to do so. The project involved the creation of a large scale drawing based on a multiple exposure portrait photograph. The finished drawing, of which this is a reproduction, measures roughly one and a half meters by one meter, and it was made with, with charcoal and graphite. My appropriated source was originally taken by John Deakin, who famously worked at the same time as Francis Bacon and supplied him with many of his working documents, including portraits of George Dyer, Bacon's lover. This photograph, a portrait of Dyer, was actually commissioned by Bacon for his own appropriation. All photographs are transformative in the sense that they transform the subject through representation. Deakin's approach to photography, however, was different to that of Mybridge, and here the complicated relation between objectivity and subjectivity, form and function, is all too apparent, and it is, problem it is a problematic inherent in the artistic appropriation of photography. The human form in Deakin's photograph relates to the particular form of George Dyer. It acquires a figurative aspect, in part through its particularity. A portrait commissioned by an artist more than a mere representation of a person, it's a resemblance of a specific person. And this indicates subjective qualities related to both personality and to the idea of art that are lacking in the Mybridge photographs. My appropriation of this photograph, therefore, involves tacit acknowledgement of a level of subjectivity that was never an issue in my previous appropriation of Mybridge's work. However, just to complicate things further, the deliberately, objectively engineered multiple viewpoint of Deakin's photograph perhaps was the primary inspirational hook for me and was asked for specifically by Bacon, according probably to an idea for his painting, and was therefore specifically geared to functional requirements. From this point of view, my appropriation of the photograph, or at least a production reproduction of it, as the source for my own drawing, could be seen to derive from a reciprocal inter interrelation between the subjective and the objective. Where the original inspiration was an objective interest in the complexity of the image, there was moreover a profoundly subjective but elusive intention, which always manifests itself in a familiar feeling when I approach my work, but sadly remains something I can never adequately verbalise. Deleuze would, I hope, point out in my defence here that far from being inadequate, such feeling is the important issue because for him it's sensation, the descriptive term for feeling, that's the catalyst for the true experience of art. The difference in levels or quality of figuration, as exemplified in the distinction between Deacon's work and my bridges, is related to the concern with sensation, in the same way that the particularity of the personal is related to the concern with the figure beyond figuration. Figuration must always remain intrinsically linked to representation and transformation, and as such, it can never affect a true resemblance of the subject, which is the only way to encounter the figure itself. The generation of resemblance requires transfiguration. Cézanne, the father of modern art, who, unlike Bacon, focused primarily on nature and landscape, was nevertheless the first to document and thus elevate the concept of sensation as an artistic way to escape figuration in all its guises and move toward the true figure, which, in these terms, is defined as a sensible form related to sensation. Cézanne always painted from life, documenting nature from nature itself as he saw it. Bacon, on the other hand, was prolific in his appropriation of photographs as source material, he used reproductions from books, newspapers and film stills, as well as commissioning his own photographs. Despite this difference in working method between the two artists, however, the fundamental principle remains the same. Transformation is not enough, and sensation is the catalyst for the transfiguration necessary to reveal the true figure. As D. H. Lawrence notes for Cézanne, painting the sensation was to achieve the appleiness of the apple. And this would be the case whether the original apple was the real thing or a photograph. Excuse me, it's in water. Where it derives 
From the appropriation of photographic documentation, however, the art object, already a complex thing, becomes even more complex, indeed a multi-layered complexity. Where a photograph documents the transformation of its subject through representation, it defines figuration. But where the photograph is then appropriated as source material for the creative process, as in Bacon's work and in my own drawing, the resulting art object embodies a level of transfiguration, not just of the subject of the photograph, but of the photograph itself. Hopefully this will become clearer as I move on. Deleuze says that we all become in sensation, thus justifying Bacon's often professed need to unlock the valves of feeling and stimulate the nervous system with his art. Deleuze argues further that whereas the creative act that moves figuration towards abstraction appeals to the cognitive, to the head, that which moves figuration towards feeling, sensation, gets closer to the true humanity of the subject, thus revealing the true figure, the true resemblance. In Bacon's work, in the appeal to sensation, to emotion, his paintings are, in this sense, art objects that go beyond the representation and transformation of human form, according only to the artist's subjective interpretation. His images move towards the revelation of the form in terms of its spirit, its essential humanity, and thus they transfigure, even while often appearing to disfigure, in their abstraction and their distortion from the original photographs that he used as inspiration. With my drawing, I wanted to, to get beyond the transformative figuration of the photograph and affect a form of transfiguration through a subjective exploration or a reworking of its content, both towards and through sensation. To begin discussing my specific process, I'll start at the end, with the relationship between the finished drawing and its source. This relationship is important in terms of how we conceive of the artist artistic appropriation of photographs in general, and where the line can be drawn between imitation and innovation. An important aspect of the relationship between the drawing and the photograph is temporality. Art practice involves finding the image through the process of creating it over time, battling, negotiating and finally bargaining with it. The finished drawing being the result of this process embodies therefore a duration of time with a beginning and an end and it must always fail to capture the subject in the way that we can take a photograph with impunity, freezing it in the instant. Indeed, where appropriation is the taking or the use of something forcefully or without permission, we could say that photography itself is a form of appropriation. Appropriation, that is, of a specific presence at a specific time. Notwithstanding the enormous advances in photogra photographic practice brought about by modern technology and digital media, in more prosaic terms, this temporal disparity between the intrinsic natures of the source and the result of artistic appropriation is demonstrated by Roland Barthes in his last work, Camera Lucida, in which he asserts that the very essence of photography is just this capacity to capture and freeze a subject in time. He conceived of photography not necessarily as art, but more as a reference to the what has been, the irrevocable existence in the past, such as the subject of photographs being frozen, are absolutely, irrefutably present, and yet already deferred. They suffer a flat death. Conversely, art seeks to transfigure the photograph, giving life and spirit back to the subject. Far from arresting the subject in the instant, the creative process inculcates a past, the before, directed towards a future, the after, and within such process both the subject and the drawing engage in a mutual becoming through a duration, a birthing and a development through the passage of time. Deleuze's endless conjunction, and, 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 moves process towards the future even whilst its roots remain in the past, thereby creating a fusion between the two in what is an incorporeal and indefinable present. Process, coextensive with becoming, is here an event, a multiplicity that's infinitely divisible, and as such, the art object is distinct in nature and character from the photograph, which is te Sartre's temporal atom, Barthes' subtle moment, a self-sufficient singularity, indivisible in itself. A photograph identifies and defines a before and an after within the context of its being a frozen instant. A painting or a drawing, on the other hand, 
being derived from and therefore embodying a process also embodies a potential that's a necessary given in the infinitely divisible temporality of process. It is precisely this potentiality, the endless becoming, that underwrites the transfiguration of a subject that did indeed suffer Balthus' flat death for the photograph, yet is resurrected through artistic appropriation. The drawn image, essentially an illusion in itself, a three-dimensional subject represented on a two-dimensional surface, nevertheless supports the idea that direct lineal progression, the duration of time, is also an illusion. The line of becoming, delineating duration, by nature of its being a process, is in effect Deleuze's ransom, twisting, warping and turning in on itself as it continues through an ambiguous and protracted multiplication of additions and subtractions. The potential inherent in such a process is characterised in Sartre's unrestrained progression, gaining some of its momentum from an open-ended what if, what if. Further, Lomax says that real duration is actually psychological, and that just as there can be no direct lineal progression between past and future, there can be no absolute before and after. The process is endless. And when the drawing is finished, it only interrupts process, never negates it. The legacy of process remains held within the stillness of the surface, always the potential for movement, but replete in the silence after the storm of action. So, although the drawing process can be conceived as having a beginning and an end, and as such a before and an after, in terms of the relationship between the photograph and the drawing itself, before and after is tangible and limiting in the photograph, and intangible, but nevertheless infinite and in potential in the art object. Where the photograph freezes the instant, it could be said that it captures the now, the present. But we have seen that the present is a phenomenon, impossible to define, because a continuous and perpetual self-renewal places it always in the middle, where Deleuze promises that things pick up speed. The present is intangible, ungraspable time. It is as impossible to define precisely as it would be to pinpoint the exact position of an, of an arrow in flight. The present is the superimposition that precipitates the fusion of the past and the future. It is in the random marks that I make as I draw, the intentional and unintentional lines and smudges that build up the image and become an intrinsic part of the creative process as a whole. The concept of ungraspable time is alluded to, and note, I do not say illustrated, in the complexity of my drawing. The rendering of the multifocus exposure in the photograph through the laying, layering of line and tone on the paper, incorporates the duration of time simultaneously in the creative process and in the result. Further, we must concede that where there is temporality, there is movement, at least in terms of duration. And here in the drawing, the fusion of past and future is inherent, both in the layers of the work and in the sensation of movement in the image itself. The figure of Dyer is caught in the middle, it is held in the momentary shift where legs cross and a shoulder drops as the head turns away. It's essentially a static, static image, but beyond its embodied stasis on the paper, there's a feeling of kinesis that derives from more than the perceptual excuse me, I'll say that again, more than the perceptual disassociation that is provoked by the multiple viewpoints of the fundamental form. I quibble with Deleuze's interpretation in the logic of sensation of Kafka's law that defines immobility beyond movement. Perhaps I'm being too pedantic to demand that he completes the construction, but nevertheless it follows that if where beyond standing up there is sitting down, conversely, beyond sitting down there must be standing up. Likewise, if beyond sitting down there's lying down, then do so. But in logical progression, and this is the real point, beyond lying down, there's that which Deleuze describes as dissipation, where movement exceeds physical limitations and must refer to sensation. This is where the mental world supersedes the physical and becomes the force of art, the power of the potential that is inherent in and expressed through the art process. Through a constant appeal to sensation, Art therefore evokes a form of movement beyond stasis, which can be more evocative of action than the actual perception of movement. As Deleuze says, in short, it's not movement that explains sensation, but sensation that explains what remains of movement. 
Movement here refers not only to physical action or inaction of the figure, but also, as in ungraspable time, to physical, it, sorry, invisible, ungraspable forces, including potential, that act upon it. I'd like now to talk about the creative process itself, as it pertains to this particular drawing, from a personal perspective. From such a point of departure, Deleuze will forgive me, I'm sure, if in the discussion I take issue with some of his ideas. As an artist, the result of my labour is less important to me than the way in which I achieve it. The creative process involves both expected and unexpected challenges. It offers freedom and hope at the same time as it threatens despair and annihilation. It asks unanswerable questions, provides unlooked for answers. It can be as repetitive and as constant as a pendulum swing, or as erratic and as ephemeral as a butterfly on the breeze. Most of all, where transfiguration resides in the duration of the search for it, in looking for it, I must take risks, the biggest being, perhaps, to begin at all. Deleuze says that the emptiness of the blank paper is a lie. In the reversal of the Emperor's fortune, the seemingly naked surface is in fact clothed with contingency, an overpowering content of clichés, givens and probabilities, born of my experiences and desires, the whole history behind what I want to do when faced with the means to do it. In this case, I want to draw the figure of Dyer. The photograph excites me, inspires me, and I want to use it as the basis for an original piece of art that visualises his humanity, not necessarily his particularity, but more his general humanness within the complexity of multiple viewpoints. I'm open to what may happen in the creative process, but I cannot escape the influence of all that's gone before and which constitutes Deleuze's pre-pictorial figuration, a form of false fidelity to the figure, which embodies the potential of the yet-to-be-realised creative process, but at the same time as providing justification, even validation for my intentions and preconceived ideas, it impedes action. Deleuze says, I must strip this away in order to redress the balance between the purity of the creative act and the true nakedness of the surface on which it is perpetrated. I must, therefore, enter the work, not to transform what I see, but to deform, mutilate and manipulate everything that I have seen and experienced. Every one of Gadamer's prejudices recurs symbols. Every fear that masquerades as a desire and influences me. I must do this if I'm to have any chance of facing the paradox of knowing what I want at the same time as knowing that I can never fully achieve it. This is the agony of the process, my owning of Deleuze's rage, the fight with the cliché, even with the certainty that such banality is immortal. Pre-pictorial figuration remains un unremittingly in my head and is reflected on the blank sheet. It's the figuration of the photograph, the transformation of the subject into an image that's understandable through the eye and brain as cogent form. In art, however, the true figure is revealed through experiencing it, through sensation, and it can emerge only through deformation, not transformation of form. The true figure is the resemblance born of Deleuze's true fidelity. The pain of practice comes from the knowledge that even as I recognise the inadequacy of figuration in the search for the true figure, I know that I can never fully deny it. I've learned to accept Deleuze's maxim, or, albeit with a weary fatalism, that I can only achieve what I desire by leaving the scene of the struggle and thereby rid the subject of my own subjectivity. For Deleuze, as an artist, just as I must enter the work to begin, I must leave it to finish. But the irony that seems to escape him is that precisely because I am an artist, this is the very thing I am unable to do. My being as an artist depends on a continuum. One drawing must lead to another and another, because in existentialist terms, existence is defined by the other, and beyond it, there is only nothingness and absurdity. Thus, I can enter the work, Manipulate, mutilate and deform Deleuze's givens, scatter his prejudices, recur symbols, but I cannot deny the other completely, because then I'm left only with Sartre's nothingness and the absurdity of process. The constant dialectic between denial and embracing absurdity thus characterises the artistic act. And in this way, at the yawning abyss, 
Art approaches while our photography steps away. The drawing becomes the other as I draw into and away from the paper. Art deforms while photography transforms. Returning now to sensation and the relation between the photograph and the drawing, we can say that sensation is felt as art is felt, passed directly through the nervous system. Sensation, therefore, neither requires nor has rational guidelines. It's experienced, as an artwork is experienced. And thus, the figure emerges through an evocation of feeling that is independent of figuration or of narrative. Sensation is Heidegger's being in the world both subject and object, simultaneously, multi-sensible, and experiencing multiple viewpoints. We experience, therefore, on many levels. Logical understanding being only one. Logical understanding implements the transformation of form, as in the photograph, and can only acknowledge the sensation null. But sensation itself consists of many different levels. Sensation goes beyond transformation to reveal the truth, aletheia. It's Deleuze's master of deformation. Traditional photography reduces sensation to the single level of transformation through the instantaneous click of a shutter. The photograph, a perceived thing, is the opposite of art, which is ultimately a felt thing that incorporates and expresses innumerable levels of sensation. Clichéd figurative resemblances in photographs challenge the artist who uses them as inspiration to affect their transfiguration through sensation to make visible a kind of original unity of the senses and thereby reveal the multi-sensible figure beyond figuration. This is only possible through a process that embodies temporal duration, movement and the relation between sensation and action. The creative process. It depends on the artist's ability to trade transformation for deformation of form and re-establish the figure as primordial over figuration. For Deleuze, the hysterical character of the art process derives from a perpetual temporal dance, oscillating between a beforehand and an afterwards and instigating its own catastrophe. Ironically, it is through the catastrophe that the figure begins to emerge, free of the constraints of surface resemblance but a resemblance nonetheless. The figure is simultaneously dependent and independent of its own physicality. It's a free spirit. It's Deleuze's body without organs, borrowed from Arcode's 1947 radio play to have done with the judgment of God. When you will have made him a body without organs, then you will have delivered him from all these automatic relations and reactions and restored him to his true freedom. Deleuze went on to develop the concept of the body without organs with Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, where the body without organs is introduced as a virtual body that refers to the physical, organic, biological body. The latter expresses particular characteristics of movements, habits, physical attitudes, etc., but it's transversed by a powerful, non-organic vitality, inclusive of the mind. Every actual body, therefore, has a virtual aspect, defined by a limitless potentiality for traits, movements and affects, or abstract intensities, that lead to and define experience, feelings and emotions, all of which impinge on the actual body's environment and relation with other bodies. The virtual is potential, and for Deleuze, the process of becoming involves actualizing potential in various ways. Excuse me. The concept of the body without organs is entirely descriptive of the figure, the virtual aspect of the body whose resemblance depends upon, but nevertheless transcends, figuration. The body without organs is the figure, and the figure is the body without organs. To fully appreciate the concept and to understand the figure within figuration, there's a need to shift our perception of the body as such, and achieving this shift involves transcending customary forms of perception to embrace a kind of alternative reality. In art, such a shift precipitates a concern with the art object itself and the way it's been created, the process. Rather than focusing only on what's represent, represented, and the true nature of this shift is inherent in another of Deleuze's concepts, that of the diagram. The diagram is that which allows the emergence of the alternative perception of the work of art. It is the precursor of affect 
in art where affect is a sensation produced and so transmitted by the creative process and the diagram is definitive of abstraction even where it embraces the resemblance of form. Diagrammatic marks are rhizomically resonant in that they are involuntary, subconscious, free and random marks independent of artistic intention and individually without definite purpose. They contribute to the multiplicity that is the creative process in which, beyond the definite act of making a mark that must precipitate it, consequential mark making is never a finite or calculable procedure. Logic is always superseded by artistic nuance. Logical progression is always interrupted, terminated, redirected, diverted as the inflection of a line, the subtlety of a mark, reveals itself as a momentary stasis punctuating a constant dance of hand, eye and mind. Patterns and elements, motifs born of practice and experience are repeated, refined, strengthened and weakened as the drawing develops. Where the drawing process is a struggle, a constant dialectic between percept and affect, every mark is a temporary solution before another question arises. This is the creativity of the creative process. Diagrammatic marks define the figure, even while the focus is on figuration. They characterise the chaotic complexity of the creative process as a whole and they define the Deleuzean catastrophe that I, as the artist, must self-induce by risking all, by approaching the abyss, in order to cre cre achieve a creative objective. For Deleuze, it is from that catastrophe that a kind of order or rhythm arises. This is the rhythm of the figure. The perceptual shift that the rhythm provokes ultimately reveals the figure from within figuration and the diagram provides the key that unlocks Bacon's valves of feeling. Deleuze assures me that as I approach my own catastrophe in the creative process, the drawing becomes, through a complexity of percepts and affects, that produce a block of sensations within the chaos that is defined overall by the diagram. The logic of representation in this way moves towards a logic of sensation where the figure emerges from the chaos and is revealed in its essence. I step out of the artwork having achieved my goal and in this way the art object becomes independent of both the artist and the viewer and open to interpretation. This is almost convincing but from the parameters of the studio and again, with weary fatalism, I must question whether Deleuze himself has taken fully into account the practical dilemma inherent in his theory. I must negotiate the catastrophe and circumnavigate the abyss. I cannot allow myself to succumb and fall, to leave the artwork as he would have me do, because to fall is to achieve, and to achieve what you strive for as an artist is to cease to be an artist. As such, Although I must pursue the figure, I can never achieve it in its pure state. Gerhard Richter spoke of a stimul, a mode in which emergence happens, a getting in touch with the real. Where the real is the true figure, the body without organs, it may come within my grasp for the fleeting moment in the duration of the process, but as soon as I make another mark, the critical and inevitable disjuncture between the virtual and the real must occur. And then the endless multiplicity of the creative process, potentiality dictates that I can never completely finish a drawing. There's always another question to ask, always another solution to find, and as much as I want to commit the drew figure to the paper to finish the drawing, I cannot. The process itself denies me, teasing me with glimpses of what could be, but blocking the way even as I try to leave. Transformation, figuration, Creating the resemblance with Deleuze's false fidelity to the figure would be the easy way out, but figuration is never the goal. For that, I've already got the photograph. Transfer, tran transfiguration, even, is the true goal, and it requires an alternative perception, as we have seen, the assertion of sensation, even over skill. Bacon himself acknowledges this when he confesses that half my painting activity is disrupting what I can do with ease. As artists, both he and I are caught within an eternal paradox in, the, in that the way out towards achieving the creative goal is blocked, not only by the potentiality of the creative process, but also by the necessary denial of the abyss, the nothingness, the absurdity of process, which is impossible to reconcile with the need to create. 
in my drawing, the figure that is dire, must remain forever veiled by the figure of my own figure, the shadow of my own figure, sorry, never to become fully independent of me, and therefore never to be fully revealed. The figure, the body without organs, remains constrained within a ubiquitous figuration, as I am already entering a new drawing. And like Baudrillard's simulacra, the finished drawing that I leave behind embodies my presence in the mapping of the movement of my eye, my thought, my hand, and my emotion. Precisely because of my presence, the presence of Daya can therefore never be pure. And the drawing can ultimately only be a model of the real. The territory no longer precedes the map, nor survives it. Henceforth, it's the map that precedes the territory, the precession of Samulakra. In conclusion, I'll briefly sum up what has been perhaps a convoluted discussion by returning to my initial claim that the results of artistic appropriation of photographs can be far more than simple copies or adaptations of the source material. Where traditional photography has impressively taken over the role of visual documentation, it can ultimately only transform and is irrevocably bound to figuration. Art is characteristically free to go beyond the limitations of the photograph, and as such, artists such as Bacon and Curry, and yours truly, have welcomed and embraced the wealth of material that photography provides, using and abusing it for our own purposes. However, a drawing based on a photograph grows and develops through a process that's dismissed in the instantaneous click of a shutter. It becomes, through an endless connectivity, a multiplicity of substance and form, ideas and function, a connectivity that is necessarily bounded and cut short in the camera flash. Its source is a finite, objectively engineered and manipulated representation, but its end is merely a pause in the otherwise endless potential of a subjective creative process. In my drawing of Dyer, both the drawing and its source confuse the eye, but is only the drawing, inherently ambiguous, can effectively challenge the conventional understanding of the relationship between the figurative and the figure, theory and practice. As such, it transfigures the photograph through an embodiment of the multi-perceptive character of appropriation. Finally, I'd like to give Francis Bacon the last word, if I may. This is a difficult thing. Isn't it that one wants a thing to be as factual as possible, and at the same time as deeply suggestive or deeply unlocking of areas of sensation other than simple illustration? Isn't that what art's all about? Thank you.